So now we're going to get into some of the fun and exciting structural potential failure modes. Uh, this first one that we're going to talk about is radial gates. If you've worked with the Bureau of Reclamation and Tainer gates, if you're with the Corps of Engineers, the Tainer gates were named after the original designer, Jeremiah Tainer, and the Corps went with Tainer gates and Reclamation went with more of a more of a description of the gates using radial gates. They're the same same gate. May, I may use the terminology interchangeably, but they are the same gates. So the learning objectives for today, we'll describe this trunnion friction failure mode, which is the key for a, a normal operation failure of a tainer gate. And we'll talk about some of the risk factors. Um, we'll look at some lessons learned from case histories and explain other failure modes that can lead to radial gate damage and failure. We'll also walk through an event tree for this potential failure mode. So to get oriented with a radial gate or tainer gate, I'm going to go from left to right following the upstream to downstream. So you have the you have the hydrostatic force on the gate that gets transferred to the skin plate, which is the water barrier for the gate. That load then gets transferred into the, the girders, which would be running horizontally in and out of the picture. That load then gets transferred in compression to the strut arms. Each one of those diagonal members that go from the skin plate down into the trunnion. The braces are just that, they're bracing the strut arms. So again, all that load in compression from the strut arms gets transferred into the trunnion. And this is where we're going to focus a lot of time on this trunnion friction. So when you start operating the gates and that pin moves, if there's friction, which there is always some kind of friction, overcoming that static friction. If there is corrosion, that's developed in here that increases the trunnion friction and that's been the cause of some of these failures of the radial gates. And we'll go and talk about some of the different factors that can increase the friction. But some things to keep in mind is the, the strut arms are the critical structural component for these. If they buckle, there's often time leads to the catastrophic failure. Um, and then the trunnion friction that we'll talk about and just keep in mind that trunnion friction can change over time. This can be due to gates not being operated, that friction increasing on the gate. Another thing to point out is the hoist, fo hoist force. So this is when you're operating the gate with the wire ropes, you're picking up those gates. That can put additional pressure onto the gates, which puts more load into the strut arms. A little bit louder, okay, I can do that. And so increasing that hoist force puts more, puts more force into the gate. And if you have overcoming friction or if you have binding or racking in the gates that can increase that ho hoist force, it puts, more, it puts more load into the gates. So the trunnion friction failure mode that we're talking about here. So some of the risk factors, so anything that increases the friction is gonna be a risk factor. Some of these larger diameter trunnion pins, those have the tendency to increase the friction forces, and that's due to you have a larger surface area on a larger diameter that can, in, that can have more corrosion. You also have a, a larger moment arm. When you have that friction and you have a larger diameter, it can increase. These hollow pins that you'll see in some, those are likely to have a larger diameter. Another risk factor is the limited range of motion for gates that may only be operated for a couple feet, lifted a couple feet to pass the flows that are needed. And so they don't see that full range of motion and corrosion can, can build up on the other portions that aren't operated. We also have gates that are infrequently operated. That also has the potential to increase the risk. A lot of these, the Pin trunnion arrangement is also a big factor. The figure, the table there on the right shows the different types of arrangements that have been used over the years, and it shows the coefficient of friction for those. So when you have steel on steel, you have the highest, you can anticipate the highest coefficient of friction. And then there's been a lot of different variations over the years where they've used greased um, bearings where they lubricate those, but then they've also developed some types of materials that together does, doesn't require 
um, external, external lubrication. Uh, one of these in particular, the one on the bottom on the chart, the graphite insert. So those were used, those were popular in the late 40s and the 50s, and it didn't require, they were self-lubricating bushings. However, with the, the graphite on the steel, it created a galvanic cell, which le led to corrosion. Talking to me, that's the similar, the similar metals that are a concern on a lot of, a lot of structures that we always need to be um, looking out for. So those have created problems in that resulted in a lot of corrosion, which then increased the coefficient of friction well beyond this 0.1 value that was thought to be the, the correct value to use. So all of these are, is the corrosion of that whole trunnion assembly where you have the trunnion pin, the bushing, and the trunnion hub is really where we're focusing on for this. A lot of these older gates weren't designed for these trunnion frictions. They may have been designed for some, but now we know the friction's a lot higher than what it actually is. So a couple case histories that we have, a couple of them in other countries. So this first one, Ulfoss Dam, it failed in 1984. It's located in, in Norway, but you can see in the, the middle picture that the, the trunnion, the gate arm completely failed, a brittle failure completely failed downstream and there was a breach of the reservoir. The next one here was in Africa at the Luandi Barrage. It was a Tanner gate failure. And you can see on this one, the, the gate completely in a buckled state here, but there was a fairly low differential in head and they actually continued to operate, operate that gate for some time while they were replacing the dam and could build to build new gates. But this one, just from the picture, you can see there's a, a fairly, a, a large amount of maintenance that was, that did not take place on those gates. Probably the, uh, well, the most famous radial gate failure in this country, because it is the only one that, that we know of that failed during operating conditions was a Folsom Dam. This happened in 1995. You can see the, the, the breach discharge there on the right. And then the aftermath of the water drop below the crest, you can see the, the mangled, buckled mess of the radial gate after that failure. So looking a little closer at Folsom, the spillway has eight tainer gates. And this is gate number three that failed suddenly as they were lifting the gates. It had full pull, but they, had, they were operating the gates due to some maintenance and some planned outage at the powerhouse. So they had to pass flows through the spillway. This resulted in an uncontrolled uh, release of 40,000 CFS. That was within the safe channel capacity. Uh, but one interesting part of this is the gate operator, after noticing this failure, he drove down to the downstream dam, which is about 10 to 15 miles, Nimbus Dam downstream, and I believe is an unmanned unmanned facility, so he couldn't call someone. So he, he knew the operation of that dam as well, drove downstream and was able to open the gates at Nimbus to prevent those gates from overtopping and potentially resulting in much more uh, consequences downstream. So there was no life loss, thankfully, from the Folsom, Folsom radial gate failure and really no major damage downstream. Some of the contributing factors here is you see the on the left side the initial failure was one of those one of those lower strut braces and that proceeded then you create a larger unbraced length on the strut arms and that led to arm buckling and this was determined to be because of of trunnion friction as they were lifting those gates it was determined that the gates were not designed for trunnion friction loads. And this one did have those large hollow pin with the large diameter, which then increases the moment on those arms when you are resisting the trunnion friction. It was also contributing was the reduced frequency of the lubrication of those gates and a, and a lack of weather protection at the ends of the pin. So in response to that, the Bureau of Reclamation screened all of their radial gates in their inventory and determined if there's any, any gates that are at, at high risk. And then further down the line of a comprehensive review, which is performed every eight years, which I believe is similar to the Corps' 
periodic assessments would key off if, if, the, if the gates need to be looked at further. And also just the routine inspections of the gates. If there's something noticed would also key off whether a, an additional evaluation needed to be made. So let's look at what the uh, Portland District of the Corps of Engineers did to evaluate and repair some of their Tainer gates. A lot of these dams here in this district were designed and constructed in the 1950s and 60s. And a lot of them used that gra graphite insert bushing that we know had some problems. And this picture on the right shows Fall Creek, some modifications. And this is a pretty similar, uh, pretty um, common modification to these radial gates is to add stiffener plates, add plates on the existing members to reinforce those strut arms. And you can see that's towards the end where the trunnion is and that's where you get those moments and do so it really helps strengthen those members. And in this case, there were some other, shown in red are some other braces that were determined to be needed for this gate. And so now we're going to take a closer look in particular at Foster Dam, some gate evaluations and modifications that they made. So just a timeline of events. The Tainer gates here are, are inspected two at a time. There's four gates and they're inspected on a five year cycle. So in 2002, gates three and four were looked at and no signs of distress were noted. Then in 2008, they did a climbing inspection of the other two gates, and they noticed that the top strut arms and diagonals showed signs of distress. So that keyed off, well, we better look at the other two gates as well. So just a month later, they looked at gates three and four, and they also noticed that the top strut arms and diagonals were showing signs of distress. So these pictures just show some of the, the local flange buckling that you see on some of the members here. The next slide here shows we're looking at gates one, two, and three. And again, you can, you can see the amount of twisting and buckling and bending that were taking place on these flanges of these members. It was determined for gate three, so it inspected in 2002, didn't see this damage, but in 2008, the deformation was noticed. And so it was determined that this, this happened between that six year period. So getting into some of the maintenance, design, and operation of these gates, um, just something, things, some things to note about these. If these are externally greased, that the grease follows the path of least resistance. You can see in the bottom picture there of the unloaded side, all the grease was going there versus the loaded side. And uh, these gates should be operated through a full range of motion annually. Um, the different colors of grease shows the adequacy of the greasing. The, the, the pink here is showing new grease. What looks kind of tan color is older grease. And you can see what I think is part of the, the gray looks like more steel where it gets very little, very little grease. So that is a, that is a concern is, is the grease getting all the way around this assembly, the bushing and the pin. So far, as far as design goes of these gates, the original calculations ignored, uh, they ignored the single-sided hoisting, um, skewing, debris load, and wave load. Um, the original design did include a coefficient of friction of 0.2, but it was determined, or new, new design criteria would have recommended 0.3 for this. And the thrust washer friction, so you're looking on the loaded side of that bottom picture, it, did not, it was not receiving grease. So for operation, there was some debris damage, and the gates during this time period, they were operated at full pool for the previous two years to, these, um, to this buckling was noted. And that was due to the powerhouse downtime, downtime that prompted the spill. And it was determined that these deformations and buckling were load-induced. So after finding this, you know, much concern as it should be, they went into kind of emergency emergency repair mode and they lowered the pull to 622, which would reduce the load on those top strut arms, which were the ones that were noticed to be, to have the buckling going on. And then so they ranked the gates from worst to, worst to not worst and started fixing them in that order. And during construction, the project went to lower the water to the OG crest during the repairs. Again, still talking on Foster Dam, here's the repairs that were actually made to those gates. 
So the, the top strut arms were completely removed and replaced with a larger member. They went from a 14 by 102 to a 14 by 132. And in addition, these were, would have been constructed with A36 steel, and these were replaced with a higher strength steel, the 50 KSI. These, uh, these braces were removed and replaced in kind, same size member, but they were also replaced with a higher strength steel. Also made a lot of repairs to the, to the trunnion hub and trunnion assembly. They removed all the uh, keeper plates, the pins, and those thrust washers and bearings, and, I'm sorry, and bushings, and they've replaced those with a composite specified material. Again, these, uh, these newer materials they used it enabled them to be greaseless with those materials that were used. And they replaced the old pins and the keeper plates and the fasteners there on the, bot on the bottom with new stainless steel material. So Reclamation's approach for trunnion friction evaluation is pretty similar to the core. So I'll run through, you, you do a screening, and level, screening level analysis, simplified, and then if you think you have higher risk or some problems, then you go to a more refined analysis using finite element and similar to what the, what the core does and have a, a slide for that. So we'll talk about the core's approach. So this level one, usually during a periodic inspection or periodic assessment or an SQRA, you're using information that you already have. You'd like to use information that you already have from operating history, from the design, from the maintenance, and looking at consequences of a gate failure and determine if this could be a, a driving potential failure mode. And again, ideally you have inspection reports and information to make a decision at this point. If the, there is um, concerns or the risk is looking high, then you move to a level two, EIS, which if I get the termino core terminology wrong, I think this issue evaluation study, you can let me know if I get the, some of the core's acronyms wrong. But this would be completing a basic structural analysis by estimating the interaction ratio for the gates, and oftentimes you're looking at those strut arms as the critical member. And you can use the Tainer gate module, which I'll, I'll talk about here briefly. So then if there's still concerns, then you'll move into a level three, which is this phase two IES, and this is where you're performing more of the 3D finite element analysis and to better understand the loads and the performance of the gates. Uh, this also says to ideally scale the model to a strain gauge results that are installed on at least one gate arm. I'd be curious if that, if that typically happens or not, but it'd be a great idea to get a, to actually get a feel for what the trunnion friction may be, because that is one of the, the components that it's really hard to determine what the actual friction is on these gates. So getting into this Tainer Gate Trunnion Friction module that the core has developed, and I would be curious to know if, the, if this is just internal to the core or whether they share this with the outside or not. But the purpose of this is to relatively easily assess the buckling of the radial gate arms without doing a finite element model. It includes, a, you can include a condition input of the, of the gates, and you can also do a detailed structural member input. It provides a relatively simplistic analysis to determine if that trunnion friction is a concern. Some of the limitations of this, it doesn't include second order effects and it should only be used, it's a screening, a screening level tool. And if the risk approaches or exceeds those tolerable, tolerable risk guidelines, then a more detailed finite element analysis would be undertaken. Uh, just a few more things about this module is it can be used with tainer gates with two, three, or four girders. It is spreadsheet based, but you can use, a, you do a probabilistic analysis using at risk and allows the user to select the headwater elevation. However, it does not, it does not consider seismic, seismic load, so it shouldn't be used for a seismic evaluation. And as mentioned, it doesn't include second order effects and again, should only be used as a screening tool. And so, as I mentioned, calculating what the actual trunnion friction is at a gate is, uh, is very challenging, and there's always uncertainty in this. And so this slide shows some research that was done at the 
Corps of Engineers at Erdic. And again, one of these, I, last update I have on this, it was an update of summer 2016. So I, if anyone knows, I would be curious to know if this has been implemented and how the results of this came out. But the, the goal here was to um, be able to correlate trunnion friction in a cost-effective a cost effective way. So what they were looking at is doing a numerical model. So looking at the finite element model, but also build this actual section in the lab of the gates and monitor and, and put strain gauges on these on the on the arms in the in the lab and correlate that to the numerical model and see if and see if those values were were correlating. And then to deploy the prototype trunnion friction system at a Corps of Engineers project, which I'm not sure if, if that has been done or not. So when we're looking at a failure mechanism for these gates, we're looking at yielding and buckling of those strut arms, and then fatigue due to multiple operations, other, other factors that may lead to fatigue of these members would then result in yielding or buckling. So let's talk about a, a trunnion friction event tree. You start out here with the, with the reservoir load, as you typically do with these type of failure modes. And then you start looking at different events. Is the gate operated? And then we get into a couple conditional, conditional events. And really, these, these have been kind of added to, to account for gates that, gates that are well constructed, well maintained, to, to reduce the risk for those. And these guidance, such as the structural condition, there's guidance in the best practices chapters to how to estimate these from a range between 0.1 to 1, which would be a, a very bad condition. Uh, the mechanical condition looks at the inspection, the maintenance, how often the gates are exercised. The best practices has guidance on, on using these as well. So then you get into initiation event, does the bushing fail? And then you get into the progression, does the strut arms buckle? And this is where the analysis comes from, the module that you would use or the finite element analysis to determine whether the strut arms buckle. And then you look at an intervention event, and this one's probably estimated about right, that it's pretty unlikely that intervention can take place after a radial gate has failed. One of the one of the ways would be if you have an emergency bulkhead that can be set under flowing water when you have an uncontrolled release. So that is a possibility if you have an emergency bulkhead. But I found that oftentimes, at least at the Bureau of Reclamation facilities, the, the bulkheads wouldn't be able to be set under flowing water. And so this does have a suggested fragility curve for how to estimate the probability of this event, and you're looking at the interaction ratio, which we'll talk about a little later, which is considering the bending and the axial load on those strut arms. So an interaction ratio approaching one, you're gonna be more likely to, to have a, to, for the gate arms to buckle than for these lower interaction ratios. So a consideration of some other failure modes and some other contributing factors to this potential failure modes, to this potential failure mode, you gotta look at reduction. If there's a lot of corrosion that has resulted in reduction in the member cross-section, we'll walk through an example of that. Um, is there deformation in the gate arms or the bracing members that should be considered? Is there a potential for binding or racking of a radial gate as you're lifting, as you're lifting the gate? Ice loading is also a separate potential failure mode that has happened on a couple, at least a couple of radial gates and we'll, Go through in a couple examples of those. And then failure of the trunnion anchorage. This is, as the load goes into that trunnion assembly, you gotta transfer that load into something. And this is the trunnion anchorage is where that load is transferred into. So talking about corrosion. So here's an example at Chittenden Locks. Um, these were the, the I guess the odd case here is you had fresh water upstream and you had salt water downstream and that salt water led to a very corrosive environment here at this, at this project. And these gates underwent a lot of rehabilitation. It seemed like about every decade they were doing some modifications between the 1940s and the 1980s. Um, but the excessive paint loss, the member 
member strength was reduced. The rivet heads were oftentimes uh, 20 to almost complete section loss of the rivet heads. And you can see in, in the bottom, well, you may not be able to read that, but the bottom right picture shows an area where there's almost 100% section loss due to corrosion in that area. So the a term, determination was made that these gates have come to the end of their useful, useful operating life. life. The gates did not meet current criteria in regard to hoisting, the operations, the stalled torque, trunnion friction, and or an impact load. So these gates were all replaced in 2014. So a couple of ice loading failures. This one happened at St. Anthony, St. Anthony Falls Dam in 1982, and there was a, a major shift in temperature. And when it got really cold, overnight and this led to an ice, ex ice sheet expansion and that failed the gate and you can see on the gate the trunnion down, the, down at the trunnion pin whoops that's not the light so the trunnion trunnion pin trunnion assembly is completely displaced downstream and you can see that the gates the gates are no longer in the guide they've been moved downstream and so this gate did fail due to ice loading, um, but in this case, they did have an emergency bulkhead that could be set. This uh, next failure is at Dresden Island. It was an ice loading. This is more from a moving, a moving, uh, moving, moving ice, not necessarily expansion of the ice sheet, but ice flowing down the river. And this one, in particular, it was more of a ductile failure, so it was more a failure of this top portion. And more of a had more of a cantilever section to it, so it was more of a, a ductile failure in this case. And this one also happened in 19, 1982. So isolating on the previous one, it was back calculated of a 5,000 pounds per foot ice load. Would have caused would have caused failure of that gate and significant and significant ice loads at that site um, have occurred. So another another failure mode that can have is failure of the trunnion anchorage, and this can happen due to corrosion. So what we see here is um, these radial gates. When the load goes into that trunnion, as you see in the bottom right picture, it goes into the, the trunnion hub, the trunnion assembly, and all those loads have to get transferred into the pier. And in this case, the pier doesn't extend downstream to transfer that load, so you have to put in these anchor rods that go into the dam. And that's what you can see in the middle picture. This one is the, all the reinforcing before the concrete for the pier has been placed. So you see the, the vertical steel on the sides for the moment steel, but all that all the rods that are at a diagonal there, those are the anchor rods that transfer that force from the gates into the pier. In this case, these were post-tensioned anchors. And what can happen, and what did happen here, is that there's a certain length that's greased to create an unbonded length. And that grease can break down over time and create section loss in those anchor rods. And in this case, with the post-tensioning, these create kind of a violent, a violent failure where it poked through the end of that, that box there. Um, yeah, and so this one would be easy to see if there was a failure. Oftentimes, a lot of the gates I've seen with reclamation, they're not post-tensioned, and so they're more passive anchors, and those are, even, those are hard to tell if they've corroded. You don't really know unless you can see on the ends that there's been corrosion. So something that needs to be considered when you're looking at, looking at, looking at radial gates. This one in particular, it's a pretty massive radial gate, and they had what is it, 464 anchor rods, and a number of them, six of them, have failed over the years, and, and they back calculated a factor of safety of one um, where you would be concerned. So if it gets close to that factor of safety of one, they're going to set the bulkhead, they're going to they're going to close the gate, set the bulkhead, and not not use that one. So some of the takeaways for this, there are several potential failure mechanisms under normal operating conditions, but thankfully only a few case histories. Um, there have been a lot more documented failures of Tanner Gates, but this is a result of barge impacts on the navigation projects. Uh, the structural steel materials are 
uh, generally pretty well understood for this. There's also still the range of using the minimum yield compared to the expected, compared to the ultimate that you want to consider in a risk analysis and not just be conservative. Few have been instrumented in order to assess actual trunnion friction. And there's no recorded case histories of tanner gates failing due to corrosion induced. And I think that hopefully goes to our good inspection and maintenance programs that we have. Um, and ice loading is a consideration on these dams, and especially when you have an ice load or a barge impact at the top of the gate, those gates weren't designed for loads up there. They're more designed for the hydrostatic load lower in the gate. And no, no tanner gate failure due to trunnion anchorage has been recorded, but as embedded, as alluded to in that last slide, as, the, as our infrastructures keep aging and these embedded anchors age, corrosion will progress and needs to be something that we consider. All right, great. Any Thank questions you, Adam. for Adam? There is a question. I just want to make a couple comments, though, on something, some things that Adam brought up. Um, so he talked a little bit about things we could observe uh, that would lead to intervention. Some, uh, some progressive failures we can observe and maybe intervene in, and some are not observable because of where, they, where the anchorages are located. So those are thing, this, things to think about in terms of intervention. And then also in terms of consequences, he talked about some, some of these failure modes being abrupt. Um, I think he used the word violent, but, but same thing. Um, you know, a, a quick failure that impacts how we think about consequences um, and warning time. So those are things that, you know, you think about the whole event tree when you're talking about um, failure modes. Um, so go ahead, Cody. Okay, so you had a couple questions during your presentation about what the core was doing. Uh, the first one was, are we measuring trending friction? So we are, um, so ERDIC, our research lab, they're measuring trending friction and using finite element models um, in order to validate it. Uh, one of our primary consultants that we use kind of across the country, they don't use an FEA model anymore. They're just using um, pretty much simple hand equations and they get comparable results. But we've probably measured trend and friction on at least 20 of our projects in order to use it on a higher level study. So that we are actively um, doing that. Um, and then you're, the core, I mean, were you able to then, because you have 20, that's a decent data set mm -hmm. to be able to correlate that to, to others that you can use, or, do, or is it still, if you're doing like... We're doing it on project by project basis. So we, on one of our projects, we did measure, or somebody pretty much gathered all the trend and friction data that we had from our projects, from projects in Europe, just all over the world. And we realized that the trend and friction value can range anywhere from... 0.05 to 0 0.65, um, and unless you measure it, and that's pretty much, um, you're almost guaranteed to fail a training gate once it, that training friction gets above 0.4 to 0.5. So we test it on every project when it is a critical issue, whenever there are consequences associated with it. Um, and then we are using the TainerGate toolbox. It will be publicly available one day. We're still validating it for public use. I think the Gentleman in front of me is actually responsible for it. So if you uh, if you have any questions, ask him. Contact him. Okay. <laughs> and I was just informed it will be static and dynamic when it when it's finished. So we have a separate dynamic toolbox that we have right now that I've used. Um, but I guess that's being combined in future iterations. And just a note on that, Cody. I've been um, kind of warned, I guess, or it's admonished that those toolboxes are, are really so subject to the inputs and judgment. So that's sort of um, that you guys can probably speak to this. The, the, the thing that's taking the most time is to make them as foolproof as possible um, to make sure that the inputs are, are valid. Yeah. Anything else, Scott? Otherwise, Scott has a question. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah, the, the question is uh, on the interaction and probability of failure uh, tables, you know, for uh, uh, interaction ratio one, the probability of failure is very high, which is not how I typically think about that. I was curious if there's something else. Yes. So on here, so you're saying once you reach interaction ratio of one, you're saying it probably shouldn't be 
0.999. It's shown a little higher than what you would think. Yeah. Right. Well, you got to, I mean, consider you make sure you're stripping out all the factors of safety, all the redu uh, strength reduction factors, all the load factors on this. So you would just be comparing the member to, uh, to its actual capacity. So that's one of the big things I've seen in, in, in risk analysis where the, you get the results um, from the person doing the analysis and those are included in there because that's what we do in, in design. That's what we do and we look at the gates as, as Cody alluded to. Um, and so you got to make sure all those have been stripped out. Yep, that's yeah, that's a, that's a great, great point. One of the things that is difficult for us in risk analysis when we come from design stripping out those factors of safety and when we do a risk analysis we really want to try to get at the risk with the best estimate we don't want that built-in conservatism that's really good in design we don't want that we want to get at the actual best estimate of the likelihood of failure right now and i'll, I'll probably i have several other presentations but then i show a lot of fragility curves and just to note that these are suggested suggested fragility curves they can be they can be varied, they can be changed with, you know, you want to justify that in the, in the documentation of why you did that. But so these are, these are starting, starting guides for the teams. So one component that seems like it, it maybe falls between the last presentation and, and this one I didn't see discussed was uh, failure of either the, the chain or the wire rope that lifts the gate. And you can have, and particularly the chains, if you get, uh, get, Chattering and a, and a dynamic load doesn't bind and, and stick, but it doesn't raise smoothly. Um, it's not a structural failure of the gate, but it becomes a failure to operate. I mean, one that could increase the trunnion, the friction for sure, but you're talking about just failure of a, of a wire rope as well. Wire rope or chain, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, uh, that may be covered in one of the mechanical. Yeah. I mechanical. Think, I mean, it's definitely something that needs to be considered whether it's from a structural standpoint, operational standpoint, or, um, or elsewhere, but absolutely, yeah. So what Cody said is that's usually broken out from the structural analysis and put into the M&E um, analysis. Thanks, Adam. I think uh, that's a good segue for Cody to take the floor. <laughs> 